Okay, so now you've all come really to hear Victoria speak. And um, I'm going to let Victoria introduce herself. You all know she's from Dinek and has been in this for a long time. We appreciate your coming so much to share with us here. Wait for the people. We are waiting for the people. They are coming. Oh, one more song. Okay. Shall I sing? Half dance. Good evening. My name is Victoria Schweitzer, and I'm from Dimmick. I want to thank you for having me come tonight. And I uh, had a lovely dinner uh, before we got here with the uh, lost dog. That was very nice. And uh, I uh, didn't start down this road to be this activist that I am now. And I do want to retire <laughs> April 28th. But um, I'm an accidental activist. Uh, things came at me that I just could not put my head in the sand. Uh, my dad, I always quote him, he's a World War II vet. He's still alive, 86 years old. He drives his car up to see me every Sunday to make sure I'm okay up there. And, uh, you know, he said he did not start World War II, but he couldn't walk away from it. So, and I, I'm nervous about using the word war because that ends up putting you on some pretty bad lists if you use that kind of language. But it feels like a war. It feels like an occupation. It really, and I, I guess I am part of the resistance because I haven't joined the club yet. And I, I don't plan on join, joining the club, but never say never. Um, I like to start out with something. I've been trying to decide. There were a lot of ways I could go with my talk tonight, and uh, I do have a PowerPoint. But uh, you know, I, when I started teaching 32 years ago, we didn't have PowerPoint. We had a chalkboard, and, and that's how we did it. So uh, sometimes a PowerPoint just takes you in a different direction. So I'm I'm the show. But um, I had a couple of different ideas on how to take this talk, and of course, Japan is on my mind. Um, and I, I wanted to talk, mention that. Um, what a horrible, horrible experience. And, but it's, it's not a man-made experience. That was an act of God, if you'd like to think of it that way, or it was a natural event. Uh, the people didn't uh, create that situation. They didn't uh, set up for that disaster to befall them. Um, and what we're doing here with uh, um, drilling for natural gas, we're creating this, and we're creating the potential for a disaster. The second thing I wanted to talk about was uh, one of my dear friends and neighbors went to the hospital this morning with chest pain and he lives right in the drill zone. He lives in the Dimmick gas field and he's not handling this well. I am, um, not either right now, wait a minute. I am, um, being a teacher, have a lot of experience speaking and he's just an organic garlic farmer and he just wants to be uh, at his farm, um, loving nature. He likes to hike in the woods with his big dog and look for mushrooms and he's just a real down-to-earth guy but he cannot take much more of what he's been asked to endure and on his way to his day job he's a mason by trade uh, he took himself to the hospital with chest pains it's stress he just recently wrote his first public letter uh, just really blasting uh, our community for being so cold-hearted about um, getting us a water line and that's a little aside here but so he ended up in the hospital. A few months ago, another neighbor um, had a massive heart attack. A uh, young man, and he has a stint in his heart now. And the story all began with uh, uh, Ken Ely, who lives on the mountain behind me. He died two years ago this May of a heart attack. These are all good men who are, have been asked to endure something that they shouldn't be asked to endure. So I'd like to start with something I wrote. <clears throat> a good man, a good life. 
We live in a community of shattered dreams. Disillusioned with our government and a sense of loss, impending doom. Each day brings more bad news. Everyone here has their story, and each and every one of them can bring me to tears every time I hear it. My love, my husband, defended the attack on my honesty Friday night. Um, this is a little aside, and I'll explain it to you. Uh, Senator Yaw, who is my state senator, questioned the authenticity of the photographs that I wanted him to view. I offered to show him the place in the photos in person if he would tour Dimmick with me. He sneered, I've been to Dimmick. I was stunned at his remarks. I'm usually not speechless, but I never imagined he would speak to me like that. The correct political response, this is my state senator, would have been something like, we are very sorry what has happened in Dimmick and we'll make sure it does not happen elsewhere. <laughs> Indeed, he denied Dimmick again. I don't want to talk about y'all tonight or anymore. I'd like to tell you about my husband and what he has endured since Cabot Oil and Gas first slithered and then roared into our lives. Men are fixers. They fix things when they are broken, when they can. They don't, when they can't, they don't know what to do. My husband can't fix what they're doing to us. He is saddened, angry, and distressed. We met and knew fairly soon we would be together. We saw qualities in each other that each of us knew could take us forward through life. Our dreams had come true. I had been a single working mom for over 20 years. I worked hard to give my daughter a good life. I put her through NYU working two jobs. I taught school during the week and sold furniture nights and weekends. I never owned my own home. Contrary to popular belief, teachers weren't making a lot of money back then. Um, I rented and even at one time, um, went back to my parents' home for a while. Jimmy too was divorced and living the single life, but he wasn't really cut out for that. He rode his bike long distances and dreamed of building a cabin with the right woman. I'd given up on finding love until this wonderfully strong, honest man came into my life. He gave my daughter the dad she never had, and her mom the love she never knew existed. He filled our lives and promised me he would build me my dream home. We married and settled into an old trailer on a little piece of heaven in Dimmick. It was scenic, peaceful, beautifully wooded in hemlocks. A lovely creek ran through the middle of the property. Great horned owls called back and forth across the valley every afternoon. Deer slept in the tall grassy slope behind the trailer. Morning sun broke through the tops of trees and burned off the blue-gray fog. Time moved a little slower in the valley and life was good. My husband kept his word. We bought trees, we set up a sawmill, stacked the wood, tarped draped piles, dried in the sun for three years. Then we began building wonderful friends and neighbors. The man I mentioned earlier that's in the hospital today helped us. We joked about the Amish coming to help. Every minute was spent on building this house. Every dime we had went into it. It was what we wanted, a place our children would bring their children to for holidays and summers, weekends and more. We had clear skies and clean water. We could bike and hike and play in the creek. Safe neighborhood, an artist of stone walls on one side and an organic farmer on the other. Good people across the road. We had the house in the country and the big backyard and so much more. The day the land man came marked the beginning of the destruction of Dimmick and our dreams. My husband is a fixer, a builder of dreams. He does not know how to fix what has happened to Dimmick, and he does not know what to say to those who have allowed it. In 2006, the land man descended on Dimmick, and uh, we were clueless. We don't have all the information you folks have now. Um, nice guy said there might be gas out here. We're just looking. And I knew we had a pipeline. The Tennessee pipeline ran through the valley. So I'm thinking, you know, that's it. <laughs> and he said, a well. Within a year, we had 27 wells. You know, this was the first map I got my hands on. I confess I stole it. And uh, these were the dots. That, uh, that was more than one well. That was the plan. This was the core group of drilling. I wasn't told that. None of us were told that. If we have these, and we have 60 more. We have over 100 wells now, um, I think in a four-mile radius, and 54 mo more going in this year. Nearly 200 wells in not much more than 12 square miles. It extends a little bit out from there. 
Okay, the group that the area I live in is called the affected area by DEP, and that's a nine and a half square mile area, and that has 63 wells in it. So we've really come a long way from the one well. There might be gas out there. You know, that's an interesting thing too. They don't tell you what they're going to do. I'll show you. So this is my dream house. We're not done. It's not. Uh, but we <coughs> built it ourselves, and uh, it's uh, Pennsylvania hemlock and Pennsylvania bluestone, and uh, we try to use everything local. That's what we're working on. I'm not sure. But the uh, industry will um, share with their um, stockholders the things they have to tell them when they invest in the gas company. They're called inherent risks. Okay, And the, risk, the, the risks are pretty bad, like a you know, pipeline explosion, fire, groundwater contamination. Um, these are the things that they list that could keep them from making a profit or making more of a profit. I really would have liked to have been shown that list when the landman told me there might be gas out here. I think that would have helped me make an informed decision because in all of this, I don't feel I've ever had the opportunity to make an informed decision. Um, I did a very, 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 very stupid thing, signing a gas lease. And I could say, in defense of my stupidity, that it wouldn't have mattered I mean, everyone else was signing. It wouldn't have mattered. They would have taken the gas from under my property anyway. But you know what? I would really like to be that one little piece of property in the middle of Jimmick that doesn't have a gas lease. So there, you know. But they aren't honest with you. And the thing is, we have 200,000 acres of Susquehanna County leased now. 200,000 acres. Um, that's an awful lot of the land that's leased. And I don't... I think we have too many buffer zones, uh, areas that aren't going to have drilling on it. The whole county is just one big gas field now. Uh, they call us the Dimmick gas field, um, the, the affected zone, the red zone, the dead zone. Um, what else have I heard it called? It's all part of the Marcellus play, uh, the Marcellus fairway. I call it Marcellus madness. Um, you know, I didn't start being opposed to drilling. Um, maybe if I had seen that list of inherent risks, I, I, I would have been more concerned. But I didn't start being opposed to it because I thought natural gas was the clean, <laughs> clean energy. You know, what did I know uh, back in 2005, 2006? I knew that coal was bad, you know, King Coal. And I lived in the Scranton area. You know, I grew up in uh, Wyoming County, which is just uh, next to uh, uh, Lackawanna County. And I knew all about coal mining. In fact, the irony is that my husband, Jimmy, he grew up in a coal mining town. His uh, grandpas both worked in the coal mine, and you know he's, he's out here in rural PA, and now he's living in a gas field. I, I feel pretty bad about that for him. So I knew all about coal, but I didn't know anything about gas. And, and that was really, I don't know, I was a history teacher. I taught, and I just didn't know about gas. I thought it was clean. Clean, natural gas. But you have to take into account, and this is what my photos show here, you have to take into account how they get it out of the ground. If it were really just that little Christmas tree that we've all joked about, you know, oh, you won't even know we were here when we're done. It'll just be the Christmas tree, and you'll never know we were here. You know, we'll never know they weren't here now. They're going to be here 100 years. They're already talking about the Utica shale, you know, beneath that. It's, it's never going to end in my lifetime, or probably my daughter's lifetime or her children's lifetime. And we'll have to figure it out then, won't we, what we're going to use next. But it's very destructive because to get the gas out, you have to build the pad, which is clear cutting. And whatever, whatever you know, those dots I showed you, you notice how evenly they're spaced? Yeah. They're all, all like that. It's like a grid. You know, they put the dots, oh, there's a house there, doesn't matter. You know, oh, there's a creek there, doesn't matter. They put the wells where they want to put the wells. And Pennsylvania is just, you can't walk more than a few yards without bumping into a creek or a stream or a pond. We're all waterways. We're not the Barnett. We're not Texas. We have water everywhere. And after they, after they build the pad, um, and you almost think they must have a, a priority, they must want it by water because they're all right by water. And when you look at the pad, um, you can, you can see the natural slope because they build it up, 
you know, and it's truck after truck, and that's that's excavation, and you think, okay, well, that's the worst of it, and that'll go away. And they build it up, but the pad has a natural drainage to the nearest wetland, creek, or stream. And in some cases, they even put the those pipes in. Sluice pipe? What is it? Where's Brett? You know, the, the drainage pipe. They put the drainage pipe in off the well pad, and fourth grade science, you know, what spills on that pad goes in that drainage and goes right into the nearest creek, stream, pond, which is there. Um, we had our first major diesel spill on June 6, 2008. Um, the truck driver said it was 2,000 gallons. DEP reported it as 800 gallons. And they said it didn't make the water, didn't make the shopping creek. Well, I guess that didn't count. <laughs> it's red. And the red is from the diesel. And that is a, the only photograph here that I did not take personally is that one. And that came from the DEP files. If you want to go down and look at their pictures. They do keep pictures too. Um, so that was the uh, insignificant, uh, that was the first diesel spill. And I went out there. You know, We went out there and uh, for weeks it smelled like diesel out there. Um, that was just the beginning you know, of numerous, numerous violations and spills. Um, so back to the beginning, they build the pad, you know, and they build it strategically located above a creek, stream, and wetland, so that if anything happens, it washes away. They also put a pit. Now they're getting away from pits, okay? The, the new is the closed loop, but they're not all doing that, and we still have a lot of pits, like 60 pits from the beginning, you know, and many of them are being excavated right now. We pushed for that. We demanded they get hauled out of there, not just bulldozed over. So we, that's a good thing. I do have some good news. We're getting rid of pits. But um, those pits, they hold the um, flow back, whatever you want to call it. It's nasty stuff. And uh, I personally visited some of those pits roadside, and I could see the tears and the rips in the liners that are just like a hefty garbage bag. And you can see where they leaked or drained uh, into the into the soil, into the land. And that was very, very common in the beginning. Now, I believe we're doing better things now. They call it... Uh, Best practice, and it always happens. Yes, it does, Brad. Now it happens after something bad happens, they fix it or they do it better. They don't ever do it better the first time. It's a learning curve. We are being experimented on. When something goes wrong, the good thing is it might get better, you know. But someone has to pay the price for it to get better, and I guess that's Dimmick. So they build the pad, and um, you know that's the first of the activity. I watched this 710 feet from my my front door. That's the closest well. I have one 1,400 feet, one 1,375 feet, and one 710 feet. So you watch it, and at first it's, it's astounding. We call it Mount St. Helens because they built it up, 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 and I'm thinking, but they took the side of the mountain off to do that. See, they don't just put them in, yeah. why don't they put them in abandoned fields or old stone quarries? Why do they have to take the prettiest part of the mountain or the woods to do these um, uh, gas wells? I, I can't figure that out. So they put in, we called it Mount St. Helens, and the mountain got leveled and the pad got higher, and then it begins. You know, then they come in uh, with the equipment, and you're just dumbstruck when you see this uh, massive equipment that you have to get off the road, literally, two lane highways, you have to get off the road to see it coming in. It's like a really bad circus coming to town. <laughs> and uh, then they do their thing. You know, it takes a few weeks to drill, and if you're next to the drilling, you know, it's all day, all night, it's loud, and uh, the trucks uh, are dirty. A lot of diesel, it takes a lot of diesel fuel to get this clean, natural gas out of the ground, which I find very ironic that you have to use a dirty fossil fuel to get the clean, natural gas out of the ground. So your air is filled with uh, fumes, uh, like a bus station, okay? You're like, I call it port authority. You know, you can't sit outside, people don't. You know, you, you can't, one neighbor didn't even put their kid's pool up when they were doing this because it got so dirty. You know, you just close your windows and have to hunker down. And you might say, well, yeah, but that's just an inconvenience. You know, a temporary inconvenience. And I actually heard a landman from Southwestern, and I'll use the company, from Southwestern say, oh, yeah, it's a little inconvenient when we're putting in the pad and when we're drilling. And he must have used that word 20 times. Must be, in, it, it's inconvenient. And I said, you know, inconvenient is when I can't find change for the parking meter. I mean, this is not an inconvenience. It's a, it's a change of your life forever. Because you understand, they're not going to put a well and go away. It's a better environmental footprint, right? If they put multiple wells on the pad. 
But every well has to be drilled, and you're going to have to have all those trucks come back over and over. So there's never going to be a, when it's all over. And then when the Marcellus is gone, then it's going to be the Utica. And I think you have a similar situation up here with the different levels of, of gas. You think they're going to put that pad in and forget about it. It's not going to happen because it's a costly thing for them to put that pad in. And they're going to utilize it. And then they'll tell you, well, if we do the horizontal, it'll be fewer wells, right? I mean, fewer pads. So that's a, a friendlier footprint, too. But the truth is, there's going to be a lot of those pads with a lot of wells on a lot of pads because this gas is very tightly packed, if you know that. And when you do a borehole, it doesn't go miles out on the side of it. It doesn't go that far. So they're not going to leave a drop of that gas in the ground. They're not going to make that investment with the well pad and skip that big area, you know, because the horizontal will go that way and they all have to go in the same direction, either northwest or southeast because that's the way the fractures are. So it's not going to be like a spider. You know, here's the well, and there's a horizontal going in every direction. That would kind of be nice, one well, you know. Yeah. It's not going to be like that. It's going to be multiple wells shooting in that direction. Here's the well. It's going to be more like a double pitchfork, and it's going to keep going out farther and farther and farther. You picture that until every space is covered. And <coughs> you can see the... Uh, we're right there in the middle of this. And you can see the direction I was telling you, they have to go that way. So this is just going to be all covered with wells. Well, the happily ever after would be the completed well and we all get nice big fat checks and we live happily ever after. Um, some people do get nice big checks, but it's very iffy. It's not like, um, oh, you're a winner if they come to your neighborhood. You actually can be right next to a horizontal and not be receiving royalties on it. You have to have that horizontal you know, going under your property. So you can be endemic, which is a very prolific, the sweet spot of the gas world, and not be making much money. Or you could. I mean, a, a few will make a lot of money, but most people will not make a lot of money on the drilling. And that's the truth. I mean, we have 7.2 acres. We're not going to uh, get rich up on that. Um, additionally, the early wells that were done in Dimmick, and that, this is the big controversy. Well, it's not controversy because it's been documented, but this is the discussion. What happened to those wells? And it has been documented by DEP that the casing and cement was done improperly for multiple wells in Dimmick. It's, you know, that's what happened. And the gas in our water was not there before they did the drilling. Now, people in, in Dimmick may have methane, may have gas in their water. That's true. But the gas in our water was tested by science. It has a fingerprint. Isotopic testing. Yeah. Just like you have a fingerprint. This gas had a fingerprint. And both our... Um, Law firm and DEP both came up with the same results on that. So it is, we've done that. It's not like all those people just want money. They always had gas in their water. My neighbors didn't used to light their water on fire. Honest, we didn't do that for party games. Let's put the water on fire. That was a, a result of um, careless drilling, negligent drilling. Um, we didn't have any seismic testing until two years after the drilling. Hmm. I think the seismic testing might have shown that maybe we did have, as one of our state reps said, odd geology, or maybe there were places that maybe sh should have been drilled, you know, maybe like the glacial till that the locals, the older guys said there was glacial till. But you see, by this map, they were going to drill everywhere, evenly spaced. And uh, eventually they can downspace and from 2,000 feet apart, then they're 1,000 feet apart. And in Pennsylvania, I'm not sure about New York, we don't have any uh, density regulation. They can put in as many wells as they are permitted to put in. And so far, it's a go. <laughs> and even more so now with uh, you know our new administration, uh, Governor Corbett, he's quite cozy with the industry to say least. So this is my garden. <laughs> it really is a beautiful spot. Lynn has been there. She knows we live in a little hollow, kind of protected from the world, and I try to keep it that way. But it's a beautiful spot. But I can't drink my water. I'll never drink my water. And the reason I won't drink my water is because...
On January 1st, 2009, my neighbor's water well blew up. And it blew up because of uh, it had a lot of methane in it. And after her well blew up, we started to notice uh, the water change down the valley. And that's been documented also. I'd like to share this. You can see the spike. You can see after oh, yeah. the neighbor's well blew up. Okay, it starts right here. Her well, it took it went. It started about four percent, four point seven after her well blew up, and then DEP started monitoring it because they figured we were at the bottom of the valley. We might have been as far as the methane was going to go, came down the hill, and then you can see that it spiked, and we vented it, an outdoor vent. Um, and then we have had receding methane. Our methane is below 4% now, okay? So you would think, well, good, she should be happy. And I would be happy if that were all there was to be worried about. Last April, now this is April 2010, my neighbor called and said, do you have soapy water? I said, I don't know. Now we are still hooked up to our uh, water well, with our aquifer. Um, most of the people in the neighborhood have disconnected from their water wells and we have the famous water buffaloes now. Not the African kind, you know. We have the water buffalo in our yard or in a protected shed and that gets filled up uh, for some people daily. And yes, the gas company brings that. Um, and we all get supplied with water um, for the privilege of having signed gas leases. But uh, Last April, um, my neighbor called and I went outside and turned the faucet on outside because our inside water is filtered. We have a um, double filter for laundry and um, showering, but we don't drink the water or cook with it or fill the ice cube trays or give it to the animals. We use bottled water for that. So um, I took some water from outside and uh, filled some bottles with it and I said, we do have soapy water. And this turned out to be ethylene glycol was in our water, propylene glycol was in our water, um, toluene was in our water. And of course, you know, I have to say, after it took, I didn't get the results until June, now this happened in April, and uh, that's how long it takes to get results if you want them to be really you know, done carefully. So think of the waiting time you have on that. You're never ahead of the game with water testing. Uh, if there's any science people here, here's an invention. We need something like a Brita on the water faucet. And it has a, a, it'll turn a color if you need a water test, like it was detecting salt, surface detecting. I swear there's money to be made here. Water is going to be where you're going to make your money, folks, not gas. Water. So we got that tested, and I thought, yay. Um, yay, because this is going to slow things down now because we've got this stuff that they say you never get in your water. This is a little different than methane. Did, didn't matter. DEP tested uh, on their own and didn't find it. Now this was an independent water test that I had done because I didn't call the gas company to come and test it. <laughs> oh, and uh, I didn't call DEP either. So who are you going to call? Ghostbusters. You know, I, that's my... My little funny line there. But uh, that's what was in our water. Now, it's not in the water right now. If you do the research, that dissolves, that passed through probably fairly quickly. How it got there? You know, I live in the middle of 63 gas wells. It must have been the tannery that we don't have. I don't know how it got there, but it got there. And it didn't stop the drilling, and it didn't stop anything. So... Little by little, you know, I've, I've done my to-do list, check things off on who's going to help me, what's going to you know, happen here. And I'm not convinced that there's anything that's going to help uh, Dimmick. But uh, you folks have a great opportunity because you're up here in New York, you have the moratorium, you're getting informed. You know, I'm optimistic for New York. Um, let's see, what did I miss? Oh, uh, yeah, so the state's going to save you, right? DEP is going to save you. If your water goes, is it DEC in New York? Yeah. Okay, we're going to save it. If anything goes wrong, they're going to step in and, and it'll be all fixed. Or they'll make the gas company fix it. But that doesn't happen. We're on our third or fourth consent order drawn up by the state. And the latest one wipes out everything that Cabot did previously. And now what it did was, you know, 
I know you heard the story. We were offered a water line by Secretary Hanger. Oh, yeah. Okay, he sat in my living room and said he couldn't guarantee that he could drill us another water well and have it safe or stay safe. Now, do you understand the significance of that when the Secretary of DEP tells you yeah. he doesn't think he could drill another water well in your town? Mm -hmm. yes. I think that's pretty significant. Mm -hmm. So he said what he decided, you know, and they rolled up their sleeves and got out maps that they would get us a water line. Mm -hmm. Well, a water line? Where, where, you know, where? From? You know, we're out in the country. Well, it turns out Mont Rose was the nearest town. And, is it 12 miles away, then? Six. Six, it's, okay, it's six miles away. So that was going to be where they were going to do a water line. It'd be a water pipeline. And they were going to run it down to Dimmick. And, uh, well, it was going to be city water. You know, it was going to be chlorinated. But, hey, I don't, I'd rather, you know, sit, turn my faucet on and know it's not going to kill me today. So we, we were like, okay, all right. You know, what, how's this going to happen? And uh, we were really relieved, although they said it probably would take two years before it was completed. But still, we, we saw hope. We saw something coming our way, literally, a water line. And, uh, you know, uh, it was going to be paid for um, by grant money. It was voted on by PennVest, which is a state agency, in a vote 11 to 2 to give us the water line. There were just two no's, and they didn't want it. And we had a lot of con a lot of controversy of people in our community didn't want us to have the water line. Now, I, I still don't understand that. So, someone will have to explain that to me. They did not want us to have the water line. And we were shocked when signs started popping up all over the neighborhood, no water line. So what does that mean, no water line? Oh, well, you know, what I heard, we'd be forced to hook into it too. Well, no one had to hook into it that had good water. <laughs> Uh, oh, our taxes will go sky high if we get that water line. Oh, it's going to tear my lawn up. It's okay to have 63 gas wells, if, you know, but yeah, they don't so want a water line because lawn, it's going to yeah. tear your yard up. So we didn't get the water line. It was yanked. Uh, next thing we know, we get a, 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 a urgent phone call from Secretary Hanger, and he wants us all to be available for a phone conference. And uh, we get on the phone, and he says, well, uh, there won't be a water line, but uh, we're going to give you a check. Oh my God. Now, this, the law in Pennsylvania says the gas company, who take it, have to get it. And if they take your water, they're supposed to restore it. Uh, and a permanent solution is not supposed to be bottled water for the rest of your life. So much for the law. So the, um, he's going to give us a check that he and Cabot figured out, DEP and Cabot, behind closed doors. We knew nothing about it. Behind closed doors, they, they came up with a, a number. And uh, then we could take this methane uh, treatment uh, system. Everyone gets the same system. I don't think everybody has the same stuff in their water, but it was a one-size-fits-all, take it or leave it. If you didn't take it, you weren't going to get one. Uh, so you were offered a check, and it was supposed to be a value, value of two times the value of your property. You know the house I just showed you? They valued that at $80,000. You know, so uh, we didn't take the check because the, the check, taking the money and taking this treatment, uh, methane treatment system, really doesn't uh, restore our water and it really doesn't uh, uh, follow the letter of the law in Pennsylvania. Um, if we take the check, the water delivery stops. You see, they won't bring us water anymore. So I'm going to go back to what I was doing two years ago before we got water from the gas company. I'll be buying my water again. So actually, Dimmick's in worse shape now than we were. Um, at least two years ago, we had hope. We believe the DEP. I believe that John Hanger was a man of his word. But he told me, would you rather I lie to you and tell you you were going to get that water line because of the new governor coming in and the new board? It was going to be a Republican board. They're, they're going to vote against your water line. But I don't know how they could do that, because we got the water line. If every time someone goes out of office, you're going to throw out all the laws that were made under the previous uh, governor or, or senator. That just didn't make any sense to me. I'm still not, uh, I still don't understand uh, why we didn't get that water line. I still want that water line, so you could help us that way. You know, <laughs> we need a water line. I call it the lifeline because it's the only way the folks in Dimmick are ever going to really have what you would call a normal life. Um, you know, we fill our closets with boxes of water. Um, we're even hoarding it a little bit. Don't tell Cab, but we're taking a little more than we need because we know we're going to get cut off. You know, and. Uh, 
uh, the stress, like the guy I was telling you about, my neighbor, you know, he has an organic garlic farm. Okay? Um, people have pets and animals, and, and uh, you, you don't think about how much water you use until you have to allot it in bottles. And then it's shocking. I, I, I think I was wasteful. I know I was wasteful. But I always told my students, now, you, you shut the water off when you're brushing your teeth, don't you? You know, I mean, how many of us leave the water running when we're brushing our teeth? But the whole way you uh, uh, just waste water, and with, if every drop you drank had to come out of a bottle of water that was delivered, you get a whole different way of thinking. So, am I a, a, a disciple of, of gastroly? <laughs> Could I have been? Well, maybe if the story played out differently in Dimmick, and maybe, you know, but it didn't. And if it happened to Dimmick, I mean, everyone wants you to think that Dimmick is the only place, but it's not. I get letters every day from towns and people. Just got a letter from someone up here in New York that you've had drilling of some kind, that they had contamination. Could I help them? And I, you know, I get these letters at the post office, and I sit there in my car crying because I can't even help myself. You know, and I can't help these people. You know, so I, I come here to talk to you because that helps me. You know, helps me have a purpose or helps me turn something better out of this uh, this nightmare. Um, and, you know, I can go on forever. So maybe if you want to ask me questions, can I do that? Because then, I, you know, I might have missed something or, you know, I could maybe help you understand something that I wasn't clear on. But there's, you know, pages of information on this. I have three big buckets, crates of uh, material. Uh, I keep everything. Uh, I'm not a hoarder, <laughs> but I do, I do keep all this stuff. Uh, I don't know why. Yeah. Where are they getting the water from that they deliver to you? Okay, they get it from Tunkhannock. Uh, the bottled water comes from uh, uh, Endless Mountains, and he's worried. He's already lawyered up. Um, you know, we get the bottled water from Tunkhannock with uh, an aquifer that's south of us. And then the big containers, the water buffaloes, they take that from Lake Montrose, mm -hmm. is what we're told. Now, I've had, there's been issues with those water buffaloes. The water's been dirty. You know, the, and the buffaloes don't get cleaned off enough, often enough, you know, so. And then uh, last winter they froze, and poor Norma had frozen water. She's the woman whose well blew up. And she was, you know, a year without water, hauling her own water. She's a widow living on Social Security, and that really made me mad. I mean, that, that really uh, kicked up the fight quite a bit, you know. And the Carters up on Carter Road just buried their son a couple weeks ago. And Ron, he's had three heart attacks, not just since the drilling started. He has a, he has a bad heart anyway. And uh, they live uh, with the gas well in front of their house. That's their house. Oh. And that's the fracking operations. That's not their gas well. It's their neighbors. He didn't put it in his front yard. He put it up on their front yard. And, uh, you know, they'd like to get out of there. They can't live there another summer. They can't sit on their porch. You know, in a completed well... Isn't that little Christmas tree? A completed well spews fumes all day long. It vents gases. It's, it's not just a dead thing. It's, it has to be vented. We now have three compressor stations. Um, two are less than two miles, and one is just a little bit outside. And there'll be more. Ever, you get so many wells, you have to get a compressor station. You add more wells on, and the compressor stations have to get bigger. And then there's the pipeline. Everywhere you go, there's pipeline being cut. It's like, it doesn't even look like they have a system either because every well has to be connected to the next well and then they all have to feed it. They call those gathering lines. That sounds, doesn't sound so bad, does it? Gathering lines, you know. But they all have to feed into the compressor station and then they have to get pushed out, you know, to the bigger stations and, and that's how it plays out. But and the Buffalo water is coming from Lake Montrose. Uh, yeah, uh, at two recent meetings up in Shenango County, uh, we had one where we had uh, Jeanette Barth, she gave her, her talk to us, and another one at the uh, Guilford Town Board meeting last week. When we mentioned Dimmick, uh, the refrain we got <coughs> from those that are in favor of drilling is that, oh well, those things happened then, and everything has changed, now it's a much cleaner industry, and one of them said that he went on Carter Road and spoke with all the neighbors there, and um, most of them said that they would do it again given the opportunity because they were so happy with this uh, meager check that you mentioned. 
Do any of your neighbors have that attitude that they would do it again? Well, yeah. There are people that have uh, 13, 12 and 13 gas wells, 6 and 8 gas wells. They're, they're, they are making money. I'm not going to deny that. It's the smaller landowners that are going to feel the brunt of this. You're, you're not going, you have small property that you love and take care of and have clean water. You have more at risk, I suppose, because the person with the multiple wells could theoretically go to Florida and leave the homestead back there, you know. I don't know if they could sell it because that's the whole, you know, selling property, who keeps the mineral rights, it, the whole, talk to a realtor. About the person who's trying to sell their property. Well, yeah, when I do that thing about, you know, having, when I was talking about when we were building our house and we had good neighbors, I mean, the people across the street, we were really good friends with them. You know, you know we rented their barn to, um, well, my husband did all that woodwork up in the barn, and uh, you know we were we were good friends. And uh, he uh, is selling his place now. Um, he has two gas wells on it, uh, and he the starting price and 60, 62 acres, two gas wells, and the starting price was four point one million. He's down to eight hundred thousand now. Mm. Uh, you know, it's a farmhouse. I, you're not going to bring your kids out there unless you're employed by the gas industry. That's another thing. You're going to see a big change in your um, the people that live, who are your neighbors. Uh, the industry brings their own people. You know, we have we've created, uh, George Stark, he's Kevin's spokesperson. He'll tell you they've created 400 jobs in Susquehanna County. Well, I can tell you that a dozen of those jobs are the guys that bring us water. <laughs> you know? And a bunch of them are, I'm sorry, am I over time? Oh, oh. Okay. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, I had a question about the um, water testing you did, and you know, um, a lot of focus was on that the um, the chemical constituents of the fracking fluid was proprietary, mm -hmm. so it was very hard to find out. But some people have generated lists of hundreds of chemicals. When you did your water test, how many chemicals did they test for? And have you been able to pin down any of the companies in terms of what chemicals are actually going into the ground? Uh, earlier testing was just minimal. I mean, they weren't testing for fracking fluids because no one had ever really, you know, heard about it. So we had a very basic uh, test. Uh, but speaking to that, I probably didn't. Did I finish? I didn't finish your quest. Can I just finish? Oh, okay. um, there are people that are happy, but on Carter Road, I, I mean, I know the people on Carter Road. They were just down my house uh, two days ago, and uh, they're not happy people. It was Carter Road. Mm -hmm. The promise Carter of the Road. money is hard to, um, you know, these are, we're not a rich community, okay? A lot of the people out there did timbering. That was kind of over. Stone quarries, you know, people in that area live on the land a lot. You know, they, they think the land is there to, you know, live on. So if you can't farm it, then you timber it or bluestone. So natural gas seemed like, oh, well, it's my land. This is a way for me to make money. Uh, you know, everyone thought it was going to be a good thing. Um, I, I can't imagine talking to the people I know on Carter Road and having them say, you know, it, it was all great. Uh, but there are people that are very happy with, with it. Uh, they, they might still be drinking their water. Oh. <laughs> okay. What were, what were we talking about? <laughs> I was just asking you whether... Um... Oh, the testing. Um, you're supposed to get a pre-drill, right? <clears throat> Everyone tells you if they're coming to your neighborhood to get your water tested. And I believe the gas company is supposed to initiate that. Um, if you're within a thousand feet of where they're going to drill, get a pre-drill. In our situation, uh, this is how good cab it is. Um, I called and said, you know, I heard Penn State say that I need a water test because they're going to be drilling across the street. And No, no, not unless you have the gas well on your property. I said, well, no, it's across the street. I think I need a, no, you don't need a water test. Well, I did have one because, yeah, I, yeah, I was a doubter. So I did have a pre-drill, but it didn't test for a lot of the chemicals because, you know, but I do have some of the things. I got, so I have a pre-drill, so I do, that's why I'm on this list. You know, they know that my water has been contaminated, not just with the methane. All right, methane I can live with. Everybody, you know, methane, you can vent it, you know, but it's, if methane comes into my water, what else comes into my water, and how is it getting there? And I will tell you, once you turn your, once you have soapy, foamy, smelly water, you will never look at it the same, or will you take a drink of it, or want your children or their children to use it or drink it? Your pets, you know? I'm even afraid to use it on the houseplants. 
I, I use a lot of bottle, and so far it's working because they're, they're bringing me this water. But when they stop bringing me the water, then I'm going to go back to uh, maybe a rain barrel, I'm thinking, for the plants. And I'm just trying to, and we have a beautiful little creek that runs through our property, but they spill drilling mud in it a couple times. You know, and uh, the beauty of that was they, I didn't find out about that till I started rooting through DEP's records just to get a list of their violations because I knew they were had enough. And I see their G in March um, drilling mud into Burdick Creek. And I called DEP and I said, why didn't you let me know? I mean, technically in March, I could have been down at the creek, you know, with kids or dog or something. And, and DEP said, well, it was probably diluted by the time it got down to you. Probably. Probably. So, uh, recent testing that was done in, by our independent lab, and we also have university testing that we're waiting the results on, which has some independent testing, um, showed the ethylene glycol, propylene glycol. Um, but later testing in August, so that was in April, in August when DEP tested, they didn't show that. Now, it could have been diluted, dissolved. I think ethylene glycol actually dissolves fairly fast in water in, for weeks, weeks. So was it a spill? This is the technicality. If it's spilled fracking fluids, then they can still say, fracking fluids have never contaminated anybody's drinking water. Somehow there's some kind of distinction there. And you have to keep in mind, folks, that vertical drilling is what we have. The wells closest to me are all vertical wells. Everyone wants to think that it's fracking that's the bad thing. I, t I talk about cradle-to-grave operations, okay? The drilling itself, if you have a neighbor who drills a new water well, you might have some muddy water for a while, or you might get some sediment into your water well, correct? But I know people have had that happen. So you're going to have 63 holes punched into the ground, uh, you don't think you're going to have any changes in your water? And that would be nice if you think everything would settle down in a few months to years. Of course, they're going to be drilling again, so there's never going to be yeah. any settle down. But then when you have failed casing and cement, which is documented by DEP, now you have that to worry about, okay? Well, what escaped? And you talk to people like uh, Professor Bufidel, Michelle Bufidel from Temple. I took him on a tour of Dimmick, and he was shocked first at the location of the wells with the waterways, because that's he's all about that. But then he did a modeling about contamination and the density of some of these chemicals. They're not going to go this way. They're going to go down. So it's going to go down, and you might be at the house closest to the drilling, and your water's fine. Now, four houses down, suddenly they have a chemical. Well, it can't be the drilling, because the house next to the drilling is perfectly fine. We don't even know all the science on this. I mean, it's really not... A good experiment and could natural gas drilling be done safely maybe uh, you know but I, I certainly would not want thousands of wells done while they were doing the study I would rather the study be done first and uh, hey I, I invited EPA to come and, and study us I said we're already the rats you know the canary the, come and finish the job please EPA come and just turn us upside down and get to the bottom what does the plume of contamination look like how far you know there are more people that are on my list that are getting water. Follow the water truck around. And you know, the gas company doesn't have to tell DEP who has contaminated water. The landowner doesn't have to tell DEP because they might not want to tell DEP they have bad water. They don't want to be in that Victoria Schweitzer group, you know. The ball, that will ruin their chances of getting the royalty check. So everybody's playing the game. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to ask how DEP has treated you. Uh, I've heard different things, uh, you know, living in New York about this. I also wonder if Corbett taking over has made DEP even har harsher to you than they were. Or, you know, what, because, I mean, I, I think that's disastrous that he, he got yeah. in office. But, but were they ever nice to you? Did they ever seem understanding? Or? In the beginning, I developed a relationship with the inspectors. When they started drilling in 2006, there was one inspector for five counties. Herb Carlinzi, I called him up. He sounded like he was from Pittsburgh or Southwest PA. And he, so he, he was an oil guy. You know, that's who DEP, those guys were. He was the oil and gas inspector. You know, he worked with the industry. It's always been the fox in the hen house kind of thing here. And we chatted, and he said, oh, you're going to have all those things with drilling. Because I, already I had an early list of concerns. Then later they brought on uh, Mike O'Donnell, 
and uh, Steve Watson, and then later John Ryder, and then uh, Brianna, and another Mike, and uh, we have a few more now, and they have hired more, but in the beginning, we had Steve and Mike for five counties and dozens of gas wells, so, you know, they couldn't be everywhere, but I decided to, you know, develop a relationship because I lived in a gas field, and I thought it was probably a good idea, and I have to say they were very responsive. I would call Mike, and he would even come out and, and even brought a supervisor out, and we had to sit down and went over some of the concerns. So I felt really good about that relationship. Um, but he would tell me some alarming things, like, uh, I'm trying to get them to be good housekeepers. And I said, well, what does that mean? Well, you know, they spill a lot on the well sites. <laughs> and as uh, Professor Rafi has said, I think he said, death by a thousand spills. Yeah. You know, it's probably not one spill that's going to get you. But it's, you know, a cumulative, you know, dozens and dozens, hundreds of wells, and all of them had this stuff on the, on the well site. That was one of the things he told me. He's trying to get them to be better housekeepers. And the other thing that was very alarming, because I would pull up the violations on the wells that were around me, and I'd see the same violation over and over and over, and there was never a fine imposed. They never got fined for it. It's like, you know, can you imagine repeating the same crime? You know, what were we talking about, a speeding ticket? You know? <laughs> But it, it, there should be an escalating price tag for the mistakes. They should have, if they made a mistake, it, you know, there should have been a fine, and the next one should have been worth more. Well, I asked Mike about that. I said, how come you never find them? And he said, well, you know, they're, they're self-monitoring. They report their own spills. You got oh, that? Yeah. These wells are out in the middle of nowhere. Oh, I got a spill. I got to go get DEP. <laughs> It's not happening that way. Did it affect your uh, septic systems? Because hmm. I get a letter from uh, Tom and Fenton, something about Chesapeake and the septic system. Hmm. I don't know. You know, the Carters had an issue. They, they, they told them it was their septic system that contaminated their water, or something like that. Because, you know, they had bacteria, which, you know, they, Brett, can you help me on that? Um, one of the things is, is, we just had to upgrade the Sewage Facilities Act for Pennsylvania, and you have bacteria in there that helps treat, and you have the pipes that go out. Depending on what you have in your water, at times it can kill that bacteria. It's been talked about at the Susquehanna County COG meeting for the sewage enforcement. Um, there may have been okay. two in the county where they had to get new systems, mm -hmm. and there are lots when it the requirements for a new system. Thank you. But back to the relationship with DEP. You know, I thought they were going to be the good guys. Uh, um, Cabot all had white trucks, and, and DEP had a couple of white vehicles. And I said, you need black trucks, good guys <laughs> in black, okay? You know, we need a distinction here. And uh, Steve Watson, he told me that, uh, you know, he'd pull into a site, and he'd see them all scrambling, pulling plastic over stuff. Mm. You know, so these are the things I'm hearing from the inspectors, you know. So we're probably real sorry they told me all those things, now. But, uh, you know, I jotted, I've kept notes. I've kept notes since 2006 and photos and, you know, I'm, I'm a, a litigation's dream. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but uh, uh, I felt good. And Hanger, you know, in the beginning, I couldn't figure him out. I met Secretary Hanger. Y'all know what he looks like. He pictures Secretary Hanger. He's kind of tall and thin. And first time I met him was uh, 2008. There was a, a forum or a meeting with the senators down in uh, College Misericordia in Dallas. And I went down by myself, couldn't get anybody to go. And uh, it was uh, gas companies were all lined up to tell our senators that if we made regulation too hard in Pennsylvania, they'd pull their rigs out and go back to West Virginia. They're still saying that. That's why we don't have a severance tax in Pennsylvania. They still say, oh, we don't want to scare them off. Uh, oh, the gas is here. So I went down to that because I wanted to hear you know, what was being said. And I sat in the back and looked around and saw a lot of cabinet boys sitting there too. And uh, Secretary Hanger spoke about, you know, this could be a great opportunity, but it had to be done, you know, environmentally, uh, you know, safe or whatever like that. And uh, then he uh, exited. And uh, my first impression, he had a long coat on, and he had a woman with him in a fur coat and a big black car. And I'm thinking, ooh, he's like a rock star or something, you know, <laughs> who is this guy? 
But I saw him out in the hallway, and I scooted out and introduced myself, and I told him I was from Dimmick, and he said, oh, where's Dimmick? Well, you know that Secretary Hanger knows where Dimmick is now, but that was in 2008, and he didn't know that we had multiple wells already. I said, we were already drilling. He said, oh, really? And I said, and it's not going okay. I mean, I would have thought he would have known about Dimmick, the first thing to sell us. Uh, we were called the core group. I mean, we were classified by the gas company right away. They knew they had a good deal there. They got the land for beads and blankets, and they had this great, great gas load there, you know? So I talked to him, and he said, well, you're the voice You're the voice they need to hear from. He pointed in there at all the senators, you know? That would be Senator Mary Jo White, and that was Yaw, and Lisa Baker, and believe me, I've had dialogues with all of these people, and uh, I just say that I know who they serve, and it's not me. So John surprised us with what happened lately. You know, he, he promised us a water line, promised us water, and then took it away because he didn't think he would have the support with the new governor. Now, is DEP supposed to be at the beck and call of the new governor? DEP is supposed to be a regulatory agency, and I would think they'd be above the fray, but they're not. You see, they're dictated to by the, public, the political climate. Yeah. So how can you have a regulatory agency? There's no, you know, and it's not an environmental protection agency. It All it does is regulate how much garbage they can put in the water. It, it doesn't stop them from putting the garbage in. You know, Department of Environmental Protection, we have all kinds of names for them, but, you know, right now it's Department of Energy Promotion. That's what it is. And they're going to let it happen, and they're going to streamline it. Yeah. I have heard that uh, Corbett received a good bit of gas money. One million. Was it one million? Mm -hmm. For his campaign. Know, do you know about some of the senators, Yaw, or any yep. others? Well, Yaw and I go way back, but <laughs> we, don't, we don't try to communicate anymore. Mm -hmm. um, he's the one that accused me of falsifying my photographs, which you'd have to be insane to make up those ugly pictures, you know. <laughs> and that's my state senator. Um, you know, yeah, you can you can see that information is public, mm -hmm. somewhat public, but uh, they're pretty much all uh, cozy with the industry. Uh, you know, Corbett just put together that advisory board. Lynn, what is that called? The, uh, uh, the governor's advisory board. It's all industry people. Uh, we couldn't find maybe one environmental the inclined oh, person. Yeah. Advisory. yeah. 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 And so. Uh, it's it's not a good climate for Pennsylvania. I mean, we are the getting place. We had coal, came coal, now we have glorious gas. Am I optimistic? No. I, I'm afraid it's going to have to play out, and I'm not sure how we're going to fix this at the end. When uh, the, the the announcement for the pipeline in Montrose last year, and uh, I remember... Were you there? Yeah, I came down you know, for, for part of it anyway, and then I think I remember hearing a comment you made that you didn't understand why you felt like you were being in a third world country. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the things we need to be aware of is that this type of thing has gone on in third world countries for generations. Mm -hmm. It's also often gone on in, in rural areas or places where there's a lot of minorities. Mm -hmm. You know, think of Cancer Alley down in Louisiana. Yeah. So because the laws have been written favoring mm -hmm. uh, energy companies and we've kind of, you know, kind of ignored what's been taking place in uh, rural areas and third world countries, they're starting to move into the middle class areas. Yeah, and it does start, you're right, it, I mean, they target the, uh, the socioeconomics, let's go to the poor area, lease up the land for dirt cheap, you know, and then we have a substantial base, and then we can start to branch out. But now I do see in Pennsylvania, some of the local communities are, um, I recently participated in a, a group over in Benton, and they uh, did not want that exploratory well, and they lawyered up, which you have to do, and that lawyer did find some uh, uh, um, flaws with the paperwork. So I think you can buy time, you know, how it will prevail with, you know, the new administration. But uh, it, they do target, of course, um, you know, I had a dialogue with Professor Engelder of Penn State. I call him the gas god. He doesn't like that, but I do call him the gas god. And uh, he and I had a dialogue about this being the great economic boom, you know, like he's, he's the one that brought the troops in, you know, he's the one that predicted the amounts of gas that could be extracted from Marcellus. This is Terry Engelder of Penn State. But did you notice how they just hacked Penn State's budget? 50, I said, ah, oh, you didn't get rewarded, did you? I'm so surprised you've been cheerleading for the gas industry and they hacked your budget. I didn't hear back from him on that one. But, um, you know, he, um, he said to me that it wouldn't be a success story if, you know, it was the destruction of rural Appalachia. 
And I just finished reading a book, Coal River. I recommend it to everybody. It's about the mountaintop removal. It gave me a... I needed to get out of... Well, light reading, right? <laughs> I live in Dimmick, so let's go read a happy book here. <laughs> I know. But it, it gave me a perspective, you know. Um, and they're still fighting it down there. Like, they're into lawsuits nine years later. They take the whole mountain off and dump it into a stream. And then what they're supposed to do is mitigate it. Now, we're doing that, too, with Marcellus. If they take it, a wetland, they're supposed to mitigate it. Did you ever see that where they built a new wetland? Do they ever mitigate when they take... Where are they mitigating? There must be some the Mittengate place. Like, you know, what state is that? A whole state of mitigation. Yeah. You know, let's go visit that place. Because in West Virginia, they weren't met mitigating the streams. How do you make a new mountain stream? We'll make a new stream if we take that one. Where, where, how do they do that? So they did one. One. And it went back underground. Like, it didn't want to do what they wanted it to do. I mean, it wasn't, you know... You be good, stream. It didn't happen. The mitigation is a lie. It's a joke. It's to make you think, oh, mitigation. It doesn't. Oh. You focused on the testing of the water. I would like to have you speak to the whether you test the air quality and <coughs> there. Secondly, the issue of noise pollution. Oh, yeah. Did you well, speak to that? I could. Um, you know, we've kicked up our heels a lot in Genic. We've really stirred the pot. And the Carter's living next to that uh, well site. When we can see the, the shimmer come off, and then our good friend Frank went and got a fancy infrared camera, you'd almost think these pictures are pretty, but you know all those colored waves coming off are VOCs and nasty stuff. So they do, uh, the air quality was an issue, and the Carters just don't feel good. And no one on Carter Road feels well, except the people you talk to. And uh, so we got DEP to come out there and test, and they did a short-term test, and they said there weren't going to be any air quality issues with the Marcellus drilling. But if you read the document, because most people just read headlines, don't they? I uh, said this is not interpreted to be a long-term study. It was just a short, you know, just like a water test is a snapshot of the moment. So we really didn't get an air quality uh, study done yet. But, um, you know, during operations, every aspect of the um, cradle-to-grave Marcellus drilling is dirty. From the trucks coming down your little road, all those diesel particulates, they're going to go in your lungs. You're not going to sit outside. You're going to take the swing down if it's in the summer. You're not going to be outside. You can cancel, let's say, tourism, hiking, biking, gardening. I mean, this industry will replace all other industries. That's what a boom mentality is, you know. They weren't doing organic gardening during the gold rush. Everything was gold, and everything now is gas. So the air quality, then the compressor station, you can sit there and watch the fumes coming off of that. And that's all VOCs. So you have uh, a lot of air quality issues, not just the trucks, but the actual procedures, the fracking. Uh, nighttime, watch a fracking site. Oh my gosh, you see all these clouds going into the air, and it's uh, quite significant. But there's no testing, uh, no constant testing that's going on. No, um, there isn't. You know, we had uh, the venting and flaring, which are considered normal uh, operations. I like that, normal operations. You know, we didn't know what to expect. I mean, I really didn't. And the first time uh, they were flaring on the hill up above us, I was back in the, uh, the back part of the house, and I saw flickering on the wall, and I thought, ooh, I left a candle burning. So I got up and went down. And uh, I, I look out, the, we have a glass uh, front in the house, a glass prow, and I'm, I'm looking out the window, the sky is bright red, and the dog's looking out the window, and the cats are looking out the window. It's flaring. You know, the sky is on fire at night. The woods are lit up like daylight, and that, that's for weeks and weeks. And now with this new wave, multiple wells on the pad, it, it's never going to go away. So if you live next to one of these, you're going to be, that's going to be your ride for the next, I don't know how many years. So the night sky, um, you know, the noise. Um, another night I'm, I'm, I'm hearing this noise, and uh, it's like a jet is stuck over the house. I'm thinking, oh. Yeah, and I'm really thinking, a jet's crashing. Mm -hmm. But that's the, the flaring uh, and venting from the normal operations. It wipes out all other sounds. I live in the country because I like to hear the owls. I don't have owls anymore. I live in the country because I like to hear the breeze. And when we have quiet days now, you've got to relish them. 
we take everything for granted. We really do. Back to Japan. I mean, you think everything is great, and in a split second, you can lose everything. But I, I'm telling you, people, enjoy what you have, because I don't think you're going to keep them out of here forever. But you're a lot smarter than we were, and you have a lot more information, and information is power. Knowledge is power. Some of the drill cuttings that have come out of Pennsylvania into the New York landfills have had high levels of radioactivity. And I'm wondering what Pennsylvania has been doing in terms of testing. Not much. <laughs> My understanding is that to put those uh, drill cuttings in the landfills in Pennsylvania is against the law, which is why they're bringing them. I believe they're mixing them with sawdust, aren't mm -hmm. they? Then? Yes, taking they them are. To the landfills. They are. They're taking them to the landfills. That's going to Keystone and, and Scranton. They're mixing it with uh, lime and sawdust, and they're making it more solid. And now it's allowable in the landfill. So they're dumping it there in Keystone and uh, outside of Scranton. So they're allowing it, and they're not telling us that there's any radioactivity. The what? other thing that they're allowed to do is on site, they, they put them on a liner and they roll them up and bury them right on the, the landowner's land. That's mm -hmm. allowable too. Mm -hmm. The cuttings. Mm -hmm. The cuttings. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. In the beginning, it was hard to find where stuff was going. You know, the first wells were going in, the first two dozen wells. I was uh, on that trail trying to find out where all this water, all the wastewater was going. And, the, and uh, I wasn't finding any place that was, that was taking it. And uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I have myself and six other people that have seen them dump it on the roads. Mm -hmm. And he, he says, no, they don't do that. That's what they traditionally But we have seen that. Gray, frothy. Um, then I had a group of New Yorkers down, oh gosh, years ago, and some people, and we were in a low-lying car, and uh, the road we traveled on, we had to get out of the car because it, the uh, fumes and the, the liquid on the road was gagging us and burning our eyes. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, said DEP. You know, uh, I scooped up some of the water once, like, you know, <laughs> and uh, sent it off to a lab. And the chemist said, one whip, and it was chemical, but it was going to be $500 for me to test it, you know. And, I, you know, I, I was living in a trailer, building a house, and I didn't go back to Jimmy and say, Jimmy, do you have $500 for this road spill thing, you know? And then I thought, well, maybe I get the neighbors to chip in. But by the time I really got it together, plus I wasn't as alarmed then as I am now. I mean, I certainly would have, would do it now. Uh, never did find out what that was. Uh, another neighbor saw them dump it. Didn't even lift the hose up when they went over a bridge, over a little creek. You know, so it went right, you know, into the, into the water. I mean, they were just negligent. Um, you were, I guess I was struck by, because um, you're such a credible, knowledgeable person and you've been such a horrendous experience, and you obviously have the dedication and the generosity to go around and educate those of us who are trying to figure out as we go how to protect our communities. Um, so I'm a little bit discouraged that you say that you think it's inevitable for New York, because I'm wondering if there are things you've learned, and I guess particularly what's important to us, and one of the things that we would like to do as a group is establish better dialogue with the landowner coalitions because we don't think any of them want health problems or to be living in the kind of situation you are, but many of them seem to be sold by the, um, the government or the companies to say, it can be done, well, it will be, you will not have these problems. So I think many of them are so influenced by the hope of the financial gain mm -hmm. that they, they're ignoring credible information, not only from Pennsylvania, but from many, many states. So do you have any advice for us in terms of how to reach these people who have such a strong financial interest and they're not especially open to finding out what it's really going to mean for their futures, their land, their children, and all of our health? Well, as I said, I was a teacher for 32 years, and I really believe in the importance of education. I really do. And, uh, you know, it gives you power to, to know. Um, and I trying to get the word out, just tell the truth. I don't really need notes because when you tell the truth, you don't have to... Uh, you know, gee, what did I say last time? You know, I mean, you tell one lie and it's over. Yeah. And I've worked with a number of people, and if they say something that I even slightly doubt, I'm all over it because all I have is my credibility that, that I tell the truth, what I see, what I've done, you know, and I, I'm very careful to protect that, to safeguard that. Um, I think you need to start contacting your president. 
You know, every time I hear um, President Obama talk about natural gas, you know, the first time I met him, I was, you know, I I was excited about the possibilities of, of the United States. I mean, you know, we, we had some work to do. And he had a clean coal hat on. And I was a little distressed about that, clean coal, you know, because that's an oxymoron. There's, you know, then, then I knew that he was uh, supportive of the natural gas, but I think he's been duped too. The industry... They are so powerful. They've been in business for over 150 years, oil and gas. You saw Daniel Day Lewis, right? There will be blood. I mean, these guys go on forever, and they're used to having their way. They're the schoolyard bully, you know, and no one's ever reined them in. And they're very convincing. They're very, they know how to do this. They've got people totally convinced that they're going to do it safely, and maybe they're they will. In certain places, maybe there won't be one incident, but I doubt that because most of the incidents are human error. And humans always mess up. They leave the pipe open. They leave the valve on. Oh, I meant to, you know, those are the things that, uh, or the casing, we didn't wait till it dried, or, or we did something, there's always that room for error. So there are going to be incidents. Um, it's, it's an industry, and you're living in, in the factory now, and there's going to be spills and, and, and things, but they're very good at um, convincing people that uh, it can be done Safely, and then when you try to bring up a record of their violations, they always try to find a way to say, "Oh, no, no, no. I mean, we have our gas company, our gas. I didn't, I didn't say that. Our gas. They're not my gas company. Uh -huh. That gas company disputes DEP findings in our latest consent order signed by the state. They say we'll sign this, but we didn't do it. Right. How is that a consent? How is that a? Re how are we holding them responsible if we let them say they didn't do it? You know, this was the big uh, litmus test here, Dimmick. You need to know this. How it goes in Dimmick is how it's going to go across the state. If we got that water line and they made the gas company pay for that, that would have been good for everybody. Everybody. Because they would be accountable and they would have to uphold the law that if they take your water, they have to restore it. You know, and I, you're, you're buying time up here. But I don't know how you're going to stop it. Um... Aren't you patriotic? That's what they say to you. Aren't you patriotic? Oh, don't you want this? Or you want to get off foreign oil? No. And they, they have a spin. And it, they have a spin for everybody. You know, when they came to our neighborhood, they didn't promise me riches. I think they have a little. They they target you. They figure it out real fast. Um, but some people, they said, oh, this one woman in particular, she's really poor. You're gonna have a brand new house next year. They didn't say that to me. They have a way of just, they're good. They're good at what they do. That's why they're so successful. Who makes all the money in this country? When this country is tanking out, who's making the huge profits? Excellent. Oil and gas. Oil and gas, yeah. That's right. They are a nation. United States of oil and gas. They're powerful. So you need numbers. We don't have the numbers, you know. We don't have the numbers. Um, but you need lots of people. Um, and you need to focus on task at a time, or you, or you spin your wheels. Right, Barbara? You don't know which, what to go after. You, you don't know. There's so many things on the plate right now, you don't know, and you can't be effective. Pick one thing. How about the state forests? There you go. You know, the state forests. If we don't have areas that are protected for recharge or aquifers, you know, we're not going to have any water. So I think what you need to do is try to focus on one task at a time and get as many people on board as you can. But... Uh, it'd be great if they hold off in New York. I mean, I've been trying. We know we know the moratorium isn't going to happen in Pennsylvania. It's a done deal. All we can do is kind of maybe do some damage control, or. Uh, but I'm not. I, like I said, I had more optimism last year. This last deal with DEP signing off. The state signed off on us. Take the check. They offered us money and a methane treatment system on our house, and they're done with us. That's it. Are the people in Pennsylvania getting cheap natural gas? No. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think so. You would think that, right? You, you would think that. Some people have be heating for free. That's in some of the leases. That you, uh -huh. But then they'll tell you, no, you'd have to cough up all the infrastructure to make that happen. And then what you can do is ask for a monetary payment then. Things you know later. Like we sign boilerplate leases. No amendments. Oh, what's an amendment? I didn't know you could have amendments. And they said 12.5 was the state's uh, 
payment. That was what you, you know, I don't go to, up to Macy's and bargain for the blender I want to buy. I mean, he tells me it's 60 bucks. I think it's 60 bucks. But, but I didn't know that the gas company, I could say, well, I'd rather have this. And I didn't know I had to put protective language in there because that's what DEP does. You know, the things you learn. Okay. No free gas. There, there was free gas promised to the township of Lebanon. And we went there, and the uh, Norse Energy was the group there. Uh, they sent a letter to the farmers that there's been a change in corporate policy, and we're not going to keep our end of the bargain. I heard about that, yeah. And we figured out what happened. You see, Norse is trying to clean up its leases mm -hmm. so they can sell them. Right. Mm -hmm. And besides that, what they are doing now is they're drilling in the, uh, the sandstone. They're not yeah. down into the Marcellus. So it's feasible to uh, have that going into your home directly. However, their plan is to go for the deep Marcellus and the Utica. That will come out of the ground very dirty oh, yeah. and very high pressure. So they cannot have compressor stations in the back of everyone's house. Okay. And they promise to give you <laughs> propane uh, for the uh, commercial uh, viability of the well. But that's a very vague term. Yeah. You see, they'll say, well, it's not pumping enough gas, so we, uh, we're going to close this one down, and you stop getting your propane. So the land people there were extremely furious. Uh, the, the attorney ordered, uh, told Norse, it's time for you to leave the room. And then they spoke quite freely how they uh, realized they were dealing with snakes, etc. Mm. There were other witnesses there as well. So, as sad as I am for them, it was nice to see that they understood they were being, uh, I guess the word is screwed, by the, well, that's always a good thing the corporations. <laughs> uh, sometimes. Uh, yeah, so it was a very enlightening experience, and I understand they're going into a lawsuit now with mm -hmm. Norse. But Norse plans to sell off its leases. That's another thing. You don't yeah. know who you're going to uh, belong to. And exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. The but, you know, it's like Vegas. The, 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 they're like the casino. They win. Uh, yeah. You know, the gas companies, they're used to winning. They're not going to do anything that's going to uh, not have them come out winners. They're always the winner. And, when you know, the thing about having things happen to your land, you have to understand this. You don't own your land once you're leased. You think you do? You're done <laughs> There isn't a day that goes by. I mean, one of my, I am in litigation, and uh, uh, and so far they haven't put a sock in my mouth, but that's probably coming. But um, there isn't a day that goes by that I, I, I wish I had my land again. You know, I, I waited all my life to have this little 7.2 acres, and I don't own it now. I can't control what happens on it. I am in the middle of a gas field. I live in a gas field. You know, I should find a way to make money on this, right? I'm thinking of dummies um, living living in a gas field for dummies. <laughs> how to how to serve how to because you know you're going to have to know how to do that unless you get the big bonus you get the big royalty checks and you can leave the homestead and leave the property and walk away from it and go live the away place. That must be where the mitigation is, right? Yeah. Where's the away place? Yeah, everyone talks, oh, well, if it gets bad, we'll just take the money, all this money we're going to make, and we'll go live somewhere else. And some people will, but I don't know where that is. I mean, I I love this little piece of land with the, the, the creek that runs through it and, and the hemlocks, you know, and um, I don't want to leave it, but I know a lot of people in the litigation will leave. It's the first thing they want to do when they can financially do it, is they will leave homes they've lived in for 40 years because they can't find a way to live in a gas field. You know, back to Japan, those people have a horrible, horrible road ahead of them to pull their lives back together. I don't know how that's going to happen. I think of other times, historical times. I remember Bosnia. I remember when that was going on, how people were hiding in their apartment houses because of the soldiers, and at night they'd sneak out and scrape bark off the trees to, uh, to make a little soup for their kids. I mean, humans adapt, you know. And true, on a scale of uh, 1 to 10, how bad is it to live in a gas field? Well, if it doesn't blow up, you know, and if it doesn't, uh, you know, set my woods on fire, and if I can still get bottled water, I guess, you know, when it shakes down, I'm a lot better off than the people are in Japan right now. But uh, is it a fair trade for the profit of uh, and the greed of the um, uh, oil and gas company? No. No. 
One more question? <laughs> yeah, I wanted to ask. I, 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 I'll talk forever, right, Lynn? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, you've, you've done really well. I really appreciate your coming. Uh, <clears throat> Can you speak to uh, whether there were any gag orders issues? People were told to be quiet. Yeah, there haven't. You know, we're we're not. Uh, I, I've been asked that question: Would I stop talking if I uh, if they gave me a, a million bucks? You know, and told me to shut up. And I said, I have, my husband would say, "Be careful how you." <laughs> you know, he, he he's a good man, but like I said, he's not. Uh, he hasn't found a way to really uh, deal with it. You know, building the house probably has been his therapy. And I heard him talking about he wants to build a little guest house. See, he's going to keep building. That's how he's going to handle all this stress. And then we're going to have this. And we're going to be all these little buildings on the property. Because he's just going to keep building to handle his, uh, his stress. But, um, you know, I don't know how this is going to play out. I'm in litigation because, and I, I wasn't, I'll speak to that. I wasn't early on. I didn't get into that lawsuit early on because I was trying to work with the gas company. I was really trying to make us uh, real to them and I was only asking for water and you know what they said we're not in the business of providing water Mrs. Schweitzer and when one of the uh, litigants said this is before she was a litigant thinking about becoming one she said well what, what, that was Norma uh, she said well you know what are we going to have to do sue you people and he said you can but you'll lose <laughs> so they're very arrogant you know th think of it when do they ever get held accountable there might be, you, you hear about a lawsuit somewhere and somebody gets some money and, and they still go on and do their plundering. I was hoping that, you know, this was going to, Dimmick was going to change things. And, uh, you know, so far none of us have been, have been gagged. There have been a few things I'm not, I can't speak to, and I know that list, but, and how it's going to play out, you know, this lawsuit could go on for a lot longer than the people in it. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Some people might say, well, why are you still there then? If, oh. If you're concerned, you know, uh, well, because, you know, this question was posed to myself, well, why would you stay there then? Um, if they offered you this money for your property, obviously it's not well, what the property's worth, but why would you stay if you were concerned about your water, your health, the air? This is my story. This is the first home that's ever been my home, you know, um, we bought trees. We brought, set up a sawmill. It's a post and beam. It's white oak pegs and, and it just, it's put together like that. Um, our neighbor helped us build the fireplace. It's our story. Yeah. And they're not going to run me out of my home. I will not leave that. And I will never sell it to the gas company. That's not on the table, ever. I will. Oh, I guess what? I will never sell that home. It's, it's my story. You know, we hope that maybe we could tra get travel more. Jimmy's got two daughters, one in Colorado, one in North Carolina. My girl's in Atlanta. Um, it, it, it helps to get away and then come back. You know, it, you have to recharge. Humans have to, you have to do that. And that's why I'd like to, you know, I, I've got a countdown to this life that I'm living right now. And people have heard me say this before, but I have a retirement age. <laughs> I retired from teaching to retire. I'm just going to write children's books and make jewelry. And I've not done one piece of jewelry or one story other than gas-related. It's all-consuming. It's become my life. Um, April 28th, I'm done because I want to work in my garden. My parents are alive. How lucky am I? I don't, you know, my family is so sick of gas. You know, they support me, I understand that, but it's all we talk about. It's, it, it, it just dominates your life. But I live in a little valley. I'm not up on the main road where some of the people are choking on the dust. When we first built the house, the neighbor who has 12, 13 gas wells, you know what he said to me? You like living down in that hole? Wow. Well, you know what? I, I thank God every day that we, we went down in the little hole and did put the house up along the road like a lot of people do to have a short driveway so you don't have a lot of plowing to do, you know? Mm -hmm. But we went down in the valley, so we have a driveway. You don't really see us from the road. And it gives us this illusion. And it's only an illusion. But it gives us this illusion of uh, privacy and safety. So it's a good question because I have to be able to live happily there. And that's my experiment starts April 28th. Can I let it go? 
I love to garden, kind of get back in my garden, you know, have lunch with my mom once a week, go see my girl, you know, I want my life back. I've done all I can for everybody. I can't really say or do anything more for anybody. Mm -hmm. It's up to you. I've done my time. Money that the litigants were offered, could they realistically move and remake their lives? Well, could you go with what they offered you? Could you go find seven acres in that house? No, no, no. It was it was just a. Uh, all it did was it allowed Cabot to continue their operations. It was a deal behind closed doors between the state and the gas company to make it look like, okay, look, here, here's, we're doing something for them. We're throwing, we're giving them money. And what is the money for? That's what we wanted. Is the money for us to move? Well, no, it's not enough, it's not you know, enough. really, to take a loss on that, you know, and, and it would where, be enough. Where could you live anywhere? Well, you know, my husband teaches this? in Tonkan, which is just, you know, like 22 minutes south of where we live, and where I used to teach. And for him to get to work every day, how far would we have to move to get out of the Marcellus? Because anywhere we went to buy, where are you going to buy a piece of land now that doesn't either, the person wants to keep the mineral rights on it, or, you know, yeah. it's going to be drilling by it. You can't get out of it. Marcellus covers three quarters of our state. It's all over Pennsylvania. And some people, well, um, I know that money would help people right now. And it's tempting to take that money because it's like no money or that money. <laughs> you know? I mean, but what it represents is a dirty deal. It's one more dirty deal. And this time with our state's approval on it, you know, uh, a check for your water. That's, now that's precedent setting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. If a gas industry takes your town's water or your water, all you can count on now is getting some kind of check that's going to be, you're not going to have anything to do with the amount. They didn't ask us, you know, what you know, what would be a good amount, or well, I guess they never do that, but I mean, there was just no formula, just, but no, I, I it would, uh, if we wanted to, I mean, I said we'll never move, I mean, I know at some point we'll have to face that when something happens to one of us, you know, and, uh, I just say the point, though, because people do say that. Why don't you just move? But yeah. realistically, you can't just move. Mm -hmm. Many people in mm -hmm. our county are saying they're going to move. They're all going to move to Vermont or New Hampshire. So those states better get a lot bigger. Because they, <laughs> get a lot bigger. <laughs> they go to the mitigating place. There's lots of room there. That's huge. It's bigger in Texas, I heard. Right. <laughs> yeah. There's some cases where you can get the uh, gas companies to provide water filters, but... Are there any, any test cases where you try to get them to provide like an air filter in the home? I haven't heard anything about that. You know, some people have taken filtration systems from Cabot, and uh, I, I say put the dirty water in, watch the dirty water come out. <laughs> They've had people that haven't had success with them. They do offer treatment. In the beginning, the solders were given a whole science lab of equipment. Oh, let's try this. No, let's try that. I mean, it was ridiculous. It filled their whole garage with different equipment. Mm -hmm. And we didn't do it, but we're gonna, you know, keep working at it to try to fix your water. Um, but the air quality, um, hey, you know, I, if, you're, if you're enterprising, there's gonna be a lot of money made on uh, air filters and water testing and, and water, water. Boom, that's where it, put your money in water. Last question. Um, I was here and I spoke in your place here a couple weeks ago, and. Uh, I farmed it for a long time, and I also worked on the Dimmick last year. I know we never met, and I heard you. But uh, I'm looking at that little poster on the wall with the little yellow thing on it, and I'm thinking of that as a blade of grass. Everyone here has a blade of grass on their property. I don't care how many, if you have seven acres or 70 acres. But uh, I want to ask you, uh, no, 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 right behind you. Oh, I'm Large and bold. Oh. Uh, I'm just going to use it as an analogy. But uh, when I got my steam burn down the Dimmick last year, not only did the one I showed that's on my arm, but uh, I still have a tingle on my tongue. And uh, what I didn't say that last time I was here, if everyone went home and, and uh, just put a tablespoon of uh, salt under your tongue and went to bed, how would you live with that? Because I still have that tingle on my tongue. But I'm thinking... Uh, your comment about that uh, water that you picked up on the road or wherever it was, it's lost forever. Am I correct? I took it, the lab took it, and uh, last I checked on it, they didn't have it anymore. 
Well, what I'm thinking about, uh, my, my comment is, is that uh, that sample of water, okay, you saved it. But everyone in this room, like a blade of grass, they can save a sample of water every week. I remember when I used to milk cows, that when you had an issue, you took samples from every cow and, and whatever went on that truck. Just a little sample, like a prescription bottle. If they saved that every week and put it in their freezer, just like they do in the Antarctic, and they drill a borehole and they take samples, why can't people in this room keep samples like that forever? And if the issues come up down the road, they can take those samples from a time and a day and from their shelf and say, well, something has changed in their stream or in their water table. It won't hold, it has to have a, a chain of custody. Um, I, you know, I have a sample of, of one chemical that's neither the uh, ethylene glycol or the propylene glycol, but it won't, I can't do anything with it because it wasn't handled properly by the chain of custody. It's just, I know, I mean, the guy told me what it was, it was hexylene something. Um, but it's, it's a useless sample because it wasn't, Done. The, the sampling has to be done properly. I mean, you can take samples all you want, but the, the point is, if you need that sample, that's because something's happened. It's not going to save you or help you. Well, the water can change. You know, I mean, if you had, I mean, you'll know personally. If you had, but if you had a room of, if you had enough people like blades of grass and they all had their samples like that, it should have some merit somewhere down the road, in my opinion. Um, sorry to have to stop, but I'm sure there's at least a hundred other questions of one important information that Victoria could share with us. But usually, as we get close to two hours, it's yeah. usually a lot to digest. And um, <laughs> we have a couple of closing remarks, and after which people tend at the end of the meeting to mingle around and talk to one another, and we've got a lot of um, very unique home-baked cookies because we can say at this point they're made with clean water, and we can't always say that that's going to be true. Um, but the, the comments about, you know, it, this is a very wonderful large turnout, and there's also many new people here, and we can't go over all of the um, progress we've made over the past two years, but Victoria suggested that there's a lot they didn't know, and we've somehow statewide managed to slow it down which means more people are getting information, and based on where you are and what's relevant to you, people are saying, gee, I need to know more about that. Is there something I could do? And the, as those clever landmen come to you and feed you a line that makes you feel complacent, or that you're going to get your dreams fulfilled, or there's nothing you can do, which is we call in psychology learned helplessness. But I can say that in our organization here, there's a lot of crazy people who will not give up and who work tirelessly and see things happen which inspire us to keep going. And it's a very diverse group, it's a very organic group, even though everyone doesn't necessarily eat organic food, but many of us do. But the whole point being that there's room for everyone who wants to get involved and make a contribution, and we have all kinds of subgroups. So those of you who are new especially, we really value you filling out those forms and checking any of those areas of interest where you have a skill, where you have passion to get involved. And the, the coalition of you know, new to the game, people is growing statewide every day, and the only thing I don't agree with um, Victoria is that we're, we can't necessarily do this, because I believe it's a new paradigm, and it's very discouraging to discover that there's such a close relationship between our politicians and these big industries, that that doesn't mean at the end of the day, the people are going to be screwed and helpless. So if you feel optimistic in that possibility, then please join us and become involved. Yeah, a couple of things. We have two petitions, if you would like to sign them. One is a petition to the governor asking him to please expand the scope of the environmental impact statement study that they're doing. Um, I, I think most people here have read about that. Walter Hang is someone who has uh, crafted this letter to him. You can read about it. Um, right now, it does not include anything about air quality. It does not include anything um, about cumulative impact. So those are two major areas. So that is the one on the black clipboard. The other one is for people who feel strongly that there should be a ban on drilling. Mm -hmm. Even if it's a ban until we learn more. Um, I wanted to say for people who are more new to this, that the New York Times did a three-article series 
And if you have not seen it, it is really worth your while, and it can be gotten online. And I'd be happy to give you those links. I can send them to you so that you can read it. It covered the first page of the New York Times, and basically it was a series in exposing the government that had been part of the EPA that wanted to say there were over a thousand documents they found speaking to high levels of contamination that never made it into the public record. Can you use the mic, please? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Because uh, the gas industry was on the panel that stood in the way of this being part of the science behind the drilling information. So please, if you haven't seen those articles, um, write your name. We'll pass that yellow report around, and I'd be glad to send you the links for them. They can be read at free of charge. Um, How about Isaac mention shell shock one more time? Okay. Uh, we have 